Hi, welcome to the 14-day weather forecast. Unsettled conditions have returned to all parts of UK during recent days, and the prospects for the rest of October are quite mixed. I'll start by taking a look at the view across Europe and the North Atlantic. The sequence here runs from 15 GMT, Tuesday the 19th of October. At the outset, it's an unsettled picture with weather fronts pushing in from the west. Although central and eastern England are mostly dry at this point, and it's very mild for the time of the year, I'll come back to temperatures a little bit later. In the short term, that unsettled picture continues. But if we look to the north by Wednesday evening, colder air is beginning to push southwards across Scotland there and maybe into northern England. The white and pink shading over Scottish Highlands is indicating sleet or snow. Also, just at this point, it's worth noting that there is some heavy rain being shown pushing across southern parts of Britain there, associated with that area of low pressure. Through Thursday into Friday, that colder air moves southwards across all regions. By the start of the weekend, a weak ridge of high pressure is building in from the west. So that potentially leads to an increased risk of frost Friday night, Saturday morning, especially in the north. The ridge of high pressure doesn't hang around for too long, though, not long at all. You can see by sat through Saturday, it's moving away eastwards, and weather fronts from the west are returning, bringing further outbreaks of rain, stronger winds, and also higher temperatures. By the end of this animation, Wednesday the 27th of October, it's still unsettled in the north, um, particularly the northwest there, with heavy outbreaks of rain being shown. But there are indications that this area of high pressure building from the Azores northeastwards towards the UK will be bringing drier conditions into southern and central counties. I said that there's some very high temperatures for the time of year to begin with. Uh, so looking at the upper air temperature profile first, this is 15 GMT, Tuesday the 19th. What we can see is yellows and oranges over the UK, showing that upper level warmth. But if we jump forwards two days, the yellows and oranges are now gone. They're replaced with blues as the colder air filters down from the north across all parts of the UK. Moving forwards though to Tuesday the 26th, it's all changed once more. The blues are now gone and yellows and greens are replacing them. So Upper, upper level air temperatures are picking up. And if we look into the Atlantic there, there's some very warm air potentially making its way eastwards across the UK in the days which follow. What that means in terms of two metre temperatures, well, here we go, 15 GMT Wednesday the 20th. Very mild still in the south here. 18 Celsius being shown in the southeast. I wouldn't actually be surprised if values were a degree or two higher at this time, so we could even see 20 Celsius locally. Colder though as we head northwards, 11s, 12s there in Scotland. Moving forwards to Friday v 22nd, as that colder upper level air moves down across the entire country, what we see is maximums are now down to 12 or 13 in southern and central regions. In parts of northern Scotland there, they're into single figures. I said there's an increased risk of frost potentially on Saturday morning. This uh, temperature chart is showing forecast minimums at 06 GMT on the 23rd. You can see values down to 1 or 2 Celsius there in Scotland, single figures over much of England and Wales as well. So frost, frost risk is greatest in the north. There could just be a little bit of ground frost elsewhere too. It will depend on cloud cover, uh, wind strengths as well. But then by Tuesday the 26th, as that milder air returns, what we're seeing is values in southern and central Britain there, 16, 17 Celsius once again. So it's, it's just a relatively brief incursion of that colder air. It does look as though it will be pushed away quite quickly. Still somewhat cooler there in the north, but temperatures also recovering in Scotland. I think it's just worth taking a look at how those two meter temperatures um, are represented in anomalies. So this is looking at the picture right across Europe, 18 GMT, Tuesday v 26. What you can see is the UK here and the pink and red. Pink and red's been used to indicate above average temperatures. 
relative, of course, to the 1981-2010 series on these plots. In fact, it's warmer than average across much of Europe. It's really just you've got to go down to the Mediterranean region where it's still somewhat cooler, parts of Scandinavia as well. But generally, it's a mild of an average picture going right across the UK, Western Europe, towards Russia there. So, but, but the temperatures will be fluctuating. There is that colder incursion, as I say, which will be affecting much of Western Europe as well as the UK. But it does look as though the general trend there is back towards warmer conditions by the end of the first week. It's also going to be quite windy at times, especially in the short term. This chart is for 05 GMT, Thursday the 21st of October. You can see potential there for gales, especially in coastal counties. That's generated using uh, data from the Meteo France model. Rainfall. Well, 5 and 10 day charts here from the GFS. So on the left, the accumulated rainfall for days 0 to 5. On the right, days 0 to 10. What you can see is the left chart shows all parts of the UK seeing at least some rain. The spread there is probably greatest in the northwest and the southwest, tending to be drier as you go eastwards. And then days five to, uh, sorry, days 0 to 10, the chart on the right, it's quite interesting here because what we see is that the rain continues to pile up in western Scotland in particular. Elsewhere, though, totals don't increase a great deal from the uh, from the chart on the left. So it's, it's suggesting that in much of the UK, the majority of rain will be falling in the days 0 to 5 period. These are just snapshot charts, and I think the GFS was one of the drier runs in the ensemble during the days 5 to 10 period. So I wouldn't attach too much significance to these particular charts, especially the right hand side one. Just interesting to take a look at what it's showing at the moment. So how do the deterministic models stack up against each other at the end of the first week? Here's the GFS, Tuesday the 26th of October. Just to recap, it's the uh, model run which the animation was based on. You can see the high pressure in the southwest, as I mentioned, beginning to build northeastwards towards the UK. The Canadian model at the same time, basically it's a similar picture, high pressure possibly beginning to have some more influence again as it starts to uh, move northeastwards. The German ICO model, high pressure going to the southwest there, potentially coming into play or starting to. The European ECM model, relatively consistent there, the high pressure once more. And finally, the UK Met Office model, rinse and repeat. So a good degree of consistency, I think, between all of those deterministic models at the end of the first week. They, taken, taken together, they suggest that it's going to be changeable at that point. The risk of rain, mostly in the north and the northwest, with a greater chance of drier periods in the south and maybe central parts of Britain too. What about week two? Well, as usual, by this stage, it's trends and probabilities rather than, the, rather than forecast specifics. Starting with a 16-day GEFS plot for London and southeastern England, what the upper half of this shows is 850 HPA temperatures, so again at about 1500 metres above sea level. Through much of week two, they are most of the runs in the ensemble are above that 30-year average, which is shown by the thick black line. As usual, there are some runs which dip below it, and towards the end there, one or two go quite cold. But all in all, I would suggest that this is pointing towards average or above average upper air temperatures for much of the period. Rainfall, well, spikes there continue to uh, appear on the lower part of the plot through the second week. I'd say it's not particularly wet though, but you would expect there to be at least some rain in the south if this is correct. I think, it's, as I said, it's really dependent on just how much influence that area of high pressure building up from the southwest has. Jumping up to the northwest, and this week I'm using uh, Belfast as, as an example. Upper air temperatures, what we see is through week two, they're actually close to average for much of a period. So relative to the southeast, it's, it's colder. Generally, there's probably more polar maritime incursions taking place there with uh, 
with the warm southwesterly feed um, across southern and central parts of Britain not being so dominant as you, as you go into the northern parts of the UK. In terms of rain, well, it's, there's plenty of rain spikes continuing to show there through week two. They're also bigger than the ones were on the London plot, so all in all, a wetter picture. Taking those two charts together, um, wetter and cooler in the northwest, drier and somewhat warmer in the southeast, but even in the southeast, you'd expect there to be at least a little bit of rain at times. In terms of the two meter temperature anomalies from the GEFS, this chart's for Friday, the uh, 29th of October, 18 GMT, and it, it's generated by averaging out all of the runs in the ensemble and then plotting them for this given time. What you can see is, as I said, mentioned, it's a bit uh, cooler there across the north of the UK, warmer relative to the average as you head southwards, and the yellow and brown shading there spreading across Western Europe, into Central Europe, into Russia, Scandinavia, all above average relative to that 1981-2010 uh, norm. So a pretty warm picture across Europe and into Russia at this point, if the GEFS mean is correct. Coming back to rainfall forecasts and using the data tables just to break out the individual runs more clearly, this one being for London southeast. What we'll see through week two is the ongoing risk of rain. But there is quite a lot of light grey in these columns, and those are runs which are showing completely dry conditions at the given time uh, frame. And the, the amount of light grey decreases a little here, then potentially increases towards the end. So all in all, a mixed bag, some rain, not particularly wet. If anything, the trend there towards the very end is for it to, uh, to become drier. Jumping up to Belfast, this time there's less light grain the columns, supporting that idea of it being wetter as you head northwestwards, and the, the purples, blues, greens there, uh, oranges and yellows, all runs which are indicating more significant amounts of rain are present in greater numbers than they were on the London plot. So, so as I say, wetter in the northwest. Looking at the um, ensemble surface level pressure plot using York as a relatively central location, well, it's, 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 it's all over the place, I think is probably one way to summarize it through week two. Um, the average pressure for October in York is, is approximately 1,013 millibars. Having said that though, it does dip later in the month. And what we see here in terms of the ensemble mean, the thick purple line, is for pressure to be around 1,010 millibars. But it is, as I say, it's a mixed bag and that's averaging out all of the runs in the ensemble. And what you can quite clearly see here is that some are dipping down very low later on. We've got some going down to about 960, 970 millibars, one or two, not, not many. Uh, but those will be bringing in very deep areas of low pressure. And we've got one or two at the other end of the scale going up to about 1,030 or 1,040 millibars, suggesting a very uh, well-developed area of high pressure being dominant. It is a mixed bag there indeed. You could, but I think all in all, most of the runs are showing a fairly changeable picture with uh, higher and lower pressure alternating through, through, through the time period. So areas of low pressure maybe having more influence on some days than others, high pressure ridges being more dominant at other times. Looking at the uh, pressure anomaly chart for Friday the 29th of October, what we see is for blues here to the north of the UK, are indicating a negative anomaly. So pressure is being forecast according to the ensemble mean to be below the norm. And to the south here, the yellows are indicating that it's above the norm. It's, as I say with these anomaly charts, it's always important to remember that a negative anomaly doesn't necessarily mean low pressure. It just means lower pressure through that time uh, period. So I think all in all, Though, if you, if you take this at face value, it points towards a rather mild pattern with pressure tending to be high to the south, 
and lower to the north. Before going on to the summary, I just thought I'd quickly bring up this table that I've put together. It shows the central England temperature in months which preceded very cold winters. So just quickly going through this, 1916, we can see the values for January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August and September. The aggregate columns simply adding them together, you can see in red there 90.9 for 1916. 1617 was a very cold winter from the UK with the central England temperature between December, January and February averaging 1.5 Celsius. Next we've got 28, the aggregate is 93.8, then 1939 it's 96.1, 1946 92.2, of course 1946-47 very famous winter, the snowiest in the UK during the 20th century and coming just at the end of World War II it caused absolute havoc. Next, 1962, and that was also a very famous winter because it was the coldest of the 20th century. The central England temperature there for December, January, February was minus 0.3 Celsius. The aggregate value, 85.4, is indicating that the uh, January to September period in 1962 was particularly cold. For now on to the first one I remember, 1978. 78, 79, the so-called winter of discontent. Britain was hit by industrial unrest and there was lots of snow and freezing temperatures. The aggregate there, 88.8. .8. That's also suggesting that the January to September period in 1978 was quite cold. On to more recent times, 2009, which I think really is the last example of a genuinely cold winter. I know some people may talk about December 2010 with its sub-zero set, and then we had, I think, the very cold March in 2013, the beat in the east in uh, March 2018, February 2018. But taken as a whole, I think the last genuinely cold winter from the UK was 2009-2010. And what we can see here is the aggregate was 97.9, so higher than for all of those other cold winters on this list. It's probably also worth noting though that the central England temperature December, January, February for 2009-2010 was 2.4 Celsius, so although it was, it was a colder, even very cold winter, it was not as cold as the ones above it on this data table. How is 2021 doing in comparison? Well, here we go. The aggregate is 96.8, only beaten by 2009. It hasn't been a cold year compared to those, compared to virtually all of those on the list apart from 2009. So you may say that if there's any value in this type of analysis, the chance for cold winter this year or a very cold winter is low. And I just also think it's worth looking at those comparison figures for Copenhagen, Denmark, Berlin in Germany, and Warsaw in Poland, because it puts a little bit of context on the UK winter. We can see in Copenhagen, the average value is 4.1 Celsius. In Berlin, it's 1.4 Celsius. So were we to have a winter like that in the UK, it would be considered very cold here. For them, it's just the norm. And then finally, Warsaw, the, uh, the value is minus 0.7. So an average winter there is actually colder than 1962-63 was in the UK. Right, on to the 14-day summary and week one. It's a very unsettled and very mild start. But colder air will be moving southwards through the 20th and the 21st. It then turns drier, and there is a frost risk, mostly in the north. There could also be snow showers over the Scottish Highlands. Towards the end of the week, through the 23rd and the 24th, unsettled weather returns from the west and temperatures begin to recover. Week 2. On the whole, it's expected to be changeable, and there is uncertainty about the influence of high pressure to the south of the UK. But in general terms, wettest in the northwest and driest in the southeast. Temperatures close to or possibly slightly below average at times in the north, 
but often milder relative to the norm in the South. So there we have it. It's a mixed bag, as I suggested at the beginning of this uh, video. Um, unsettled to begin with, colder, then unsettled again later, although high pressure possibly having more influence, particularly in the southern half of the UK. So, thank you very much for watching this. I hope you found it useful and enjoyed it. If you did, then as ever, please remember to hit the like and subscribe buttons below. Thanks now. Bye.